Good afternoon. Uh, let's start this uh, uh, graduation ceremony. I just, uh, for a technical issue, I would like you to wear the sacks that you have, the students have in the, uh, in your seat. You, most of you already have, but many. Good afternoon. Most welcome, everybody. Their students, their graduate students, uh, parents, friends, uh, relatives, uh, dear professors and researchers of eBay. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, to open this uh, graduation ceremony for the course 2020-2021 uh, 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 for the students of the Masters in International Relations and the Erasmus Masters uh, in Public Policy uh, that we are going to uh, start uh, now. Uh, most welcome, everybody. Uh, in the name of the Barcelona Institute of International Studies or Institute Barcelona de Studies Internacionals, uh, eBay, uh, from its Catalan acronym, uh, as we call uh, it uh, most of the time, I warmly welcome you to this graduation ceremony for the class of uh, 2021. Before introducing uh, Dr. Paul Morillas, who is going to offer you the uh, graduation lecture, I would like you to add, uh, would like, uh, to add a few words uh, regarding eBay and your progress during the course 2020-2021 uh, uh, at the Institute. Ivey class, I must say, Ivey class of uh, 2021 uh, has been exceptional for a very basic reason, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. During this academic year, the entire Ivey community uh, has been committed to fighting it, and we shall express our solidarity with all those who fell ill or who lost uh, loved ones. When it started, the pandemic in March uh, 2020, few of us could have foreseen the dynamic, the dramatic consequences it has created and how strong it will impact in our lives and professional activities, and in particular, for the development of the teaching activities in higher education institutions, as it has been uh, our case at eBay. Since then, we have been coping with the circumstances created by the pandemic as much as well and as well as we have been able, aiming to make your learning experience as a master's student at EVA exceptional despite all unexpected difficulties. For this reason, I would like to thank you, you as students, uh, now graduate students, as well as the teaching and administrative staff at EVA for your resilience and adaptability to the difficult situations we have been coping with during these COVID times. During, during this very difficult academic year, I am sure you have been able, despite all difficulties, to gain a different view of the world and international affairs, not only by attending online uh, courses during a significant part of the year, uh, and also uh, participating in a wide variety of lectures and workshops, reading papers and writing essays, but also by sharing your personal experience, virtually or face-to-face, -face, keeping the necessary social distances with your fellow students from more than 50 different countries. Thus, I expect you now perceive the complexities and nuances of international politics and globalization in a way that will seriously support and fuel your professional careers in the years to come. This is what eBay has aimed to deliver to you a global thinking from Barcelona, Catalonia, South Europe, a full learning experience that should allow you to understand international relations, security, and development in a much more sophisticated and sensible form, providing also the necessary tools to be involved in its transformation. However, I must confess that eBay needs your support, including your class, 
Iwaya alumni now is over 1,400 graduates from more than 80 different countries in the world. Most of them, uh, most of you, actively working as professionals or will be in most fields of international affairs. Graduates are without doubt the most important capital of eBay, and we are committed to facilitate your connections and network networking across the different uh, years and at different places and networks uh, that already has been established uh, uh, from eBay alumni, and as well as providing information and collaboration to you in many uh, different ways in the, in the years to come. However, we also need you from now on to continue building a strong professional, personal and intellectual ties with you. We expect that you will help us to make EVA a stronger academic institution to emerge as one of the major graduate schools in international studies in Europe. But also, and first of all, a place to come back from time to time and a place to be proud of here uh, in Barcelona. Now, I will introduce you our keynote speaker for the graduation lecture. It's my pleasure to introduce you, Dr. Paul Morillas. Paul Morillas is the director of CIDOP, uh, Barcelona Center for International Affairs. And as most of you probably know it, CIDOP is an international affairs research center located in Barcelona, a think tank of international projection an amazing reputation that, through excellence and relevance, seeks to analyze the global issues that affect political, social, and governance dynamics from the international to the local perspective. Dr. Morillas is a political scientist, and he holds a PhD in politics, policies, and international relations from the Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona, and a master's degree in international relations from the London School of Economics. Previously, he was coordinator of the Political and Security Committee of the Council of the European Union and advisor on external action at the European Parliament. He has published numerous research papers for academic journals and think tanks, like uh, uh, his opinion pieces cover uh, global dynamics, European integration, European foreign policy, and Euro-Mediterranean relations, among other uh, subjects. He regularly collaborates with various media outlets from TV, press, radio, as an European and international affairs analyst. His latest book is Strategy Making in the EU, From Foreign and Security Policy to External Action. And he has co-directed very recently during the COVID uh, times, the highly recommendable documentary Bouncing Back, World Politics After the Pandemic which proposes a reflection on the dynamics of conflict and opportunities for international cooperation in the post-COVID world. We are very honored that he has accepted our invitation to give the graduation lecture this year at EVA for our students of the 2021 class. Dr. Morillas, this is a great pleasure to have you with us today in our graduation ceremony. Good afternoon, everyone. If you allow me, I will unveil myself. Um, and I'll start by very much thanking uh, Jacin and the whole of eBay for, for inviting me to, to give this uh, graduation lecture um, on behalf of, of CDOP, but also on behalf of what I think might be uh, something of your interest after graduation, which is also uh, with the aim to um, build bridges between what is uh, the research community, the think tank community, or even the policy making community. And I think that with these three areas, most of you, uh, instead of be sitting here next year, you'll, you will probably be working in either one or the other environments that I just uh, mentioned. So for me, it's, uh, it's really a big pleasure to, to be here, to also be here um, with good friends, with uh, Robert Kisak sitting here in front of me, uh, with whom I had plenty of uh, uh, good discussions on, 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 on the contents of, of my PhD, with Laia Mestras, who's sitting behind, or Andrea Bianculli also, who will address you um, uh, in, a, in a moment. 
And I was asked by, by Jacint when, uh, when he proposed uh, me to, to deliver this lecture, not only to reflect on the state of uh, European affairs and uh, its role, Europe's role in the world, but also to provide um, a couple of hints on, on, on where I think you could be heading in the, in, the, in the near, very, very near future. So I will address you with, this, uh, with uh, both these, uh, these aspects. But I'd like to start first with this reflection on a big question mark, which I think will be among us, not only today, tomorrow, next year, and the decade ahead, but uh, for the foreseeable future, which is basically the question on whether Europe can be a geopolitical power in the world that we live in. And I'm sure you will all have studied uh, power relations, the European Union as a global actor, or many of the things that I will be saying today during your year um, at eBay. And I hope that this will also help you address this issue from a, 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 different, a different angle on a day that is basically a day of celebration. So, that, so I will try to be as positive as, as, as possible for you. So we all know the world we live in. Uh, we've, uh, we're witnessing every day in our uh, newspapers, in our TV, in social media. We live in a post-Western world uh, where great power, uh, competition and rivalry is the main feature of international politics. We know that US-China bipolarity is likely to be the defining feature of the 21st century politics. We know that as a consequence of these power dynamics, we live in a zero-sum world, as some have said whereby interests are national, uh, even if the needs are transnational. Uh, and we also live in a world where international institutions are increasingly weakened or do not fulfill the tasks that they are aimed to produce when it comes to global governance. Um, so as a consequence of this, uh, and I will not uh, go into detail into these trends that I'm sure you know much better than I do, we all Europeans, in a certain sen sense, demand that the European Union catches up to these dynamics. And in other words, that it becomes a more geopolitical actor to face these dynamics, and also, as some have said, that it even learns to speak the language of power, as uh, High Representative Josep Borrell said um, a while ago. Not only Borrell, but also uh, Angela Merkel or Emmanuel Macron demand for a stronger role of the European Union at the global level. This is, to me, the big question that we are facing. Yes, the, the need might be there, but can the European Union really perform uh, that task? And to answer to this question, let's first look at uh, power. What, what does power mean from a European Perspective. And the big paradox, it is that actually the European Union was born and was built to escape the logics of power hmm? through international uh, cooperation, through the surrendering of sovereignty, uh, precisely international power-based relation where the dynamics that had been present among us for a lot of decades to be superseded, to be um, sort of ruled out on the way the world works. On economy and trade, for instance, the idea was to surrender state sovereignty in favor of supranational institutions and produce common regulatory frameworks that would enable a supranational governance of uh, economic and trade issues. On security and defense, true, we relied, we still rely on the US security umbrella, but we were aiming as Europeans to be a force for good, as Javier Solana put it, the high, former high representative put it uh, uh, even a few years um, before. Uh, on global governance, we were uh, pursuing a strong system of multilateral governance that escapes or at least complements national interests in favor of the governance of global public goods. So in all these areas, precisely the logics of power that are being that are so much present among us today, uh, the European Union was meant to change them, or at least to uh, act in a different way. However, as I said at the beginning, the EU today is asked to fulfill tasks that run against its DNA, its original leitmotif, and compete geopolitically in this world. On the internal market, on uh, um, internal economy, we were aimed at 
uh, eliminating unfair competition between member states or subsidies or unfair subsidies to uh, national um, uh, companies. And today we are instead aiming at defending um, the uh, interests of European states and companies in a much more and much stronger geoeconomic competition. On security and defense, we've transited from the demilitarization of Europe as the main objective and, uh, and in favor of a transatlantic alliance under NATO to building more autonomous capacities for acting in security and defense mat manner, uh, matters, or as others say, building more strategic autonomy. On technology, uh, European Union's role was basically to foster research, to act more competitively at the European level. But today, we are basically witnessing uh, how it is to live in a global technological race and where technology is precisely used for hybrid threats or for dangers to our uh, democracies. And even on values, we were aimed at provi providing a universal understanding of the rule of law, of human rights on democracy. And today we are rather confronted to the rise of authoritarianism in countries such as Russia, to the, um, to the, develop, to, to, to the um, uh, growth and, and, and development of certain nations without uh, democracy, such as in China, or even to illiberal trends within well-established democracies, such as in India, Brazil, or Hungary. Right? So in all these areas, on internal market, on security and defense, on technology, on values, we are, are actually acting in a world that has, does not follow exactly what we uh, thought was um, our way of understanding the world we live in. So as a consequence of this, there are many authors arguing today that Europe should be able to compete geopolitically given uh, these changing uh, realities. And here, Luc van Middelaar, who is a Dutch philosopher and, and, and probably uh, some of you know, has spoken about uh, Europe's geopolitical awakening. And he has addressed this issue, the capacity of the EU to be a, a, a geopolitical actor under three main uh, parameters, power, territory, and narrative. So let's look at them, at the three of them, power, territory, and narrative, and try to understand whether the EU is fit for purpose, whether the European Union can actually um, be able to adopt this more geopolitical uh, stance. On power, we know the realities. Power is shifting to the east, the US is pivoting to Asia, the whole world is pivoting to Asia, and Europe, despite its power, is losing not necessarily relevance, but certainly centrality. And thus, this poses a great uh, problem when the future is uh, likely to be uh, de designed along the lines of US-China uh, competition. These power relations also force us Europeans to recalibrate, or at least to put more weight um, into the interests that we have instead of the values that we promote. And uh, this means that alliances uh, at the global level, but also uh, alliances of the European Union, uh, need to be built along the basis, not only on the sort of political systems that we want to foster or build, but rather on the interests that we as Europeans want to protect uh, in face of these uh, realities. And this even leads to a certain sense of it is either together as Europeans that we can defend those interests, or it is basically chacun pour soi, everyone uh, by himself and for himself, and uh, uh, confronting this more arduous, this more complicated uh, world. And even these power relations have also um, gone to the extent of uh, being uh, in, in, in line with the protection of the citizens of the European Union. We are hearing once and again the idea of l'Europe qui protège, as Macron puts it, huh? the Europe that protects the interests and that protects even the security of its own uh, citizens. So in other words, we need a Europe that delivers and not only a Europe that, sp that speaks as an ideal construction in world affairs, but actually a Europe that is able to provide such capabilities, to provide such um, goods 
for uh, its citizens. So power dynamics, as I was saying, very much different to what we, ha were, um, we had thought uh, beforehand. On territory, and despite the fact and the truth that global politics today is very much deterritorialized, huh? so the pandemic is a clear example, but also climate emergencies and, and so on, despite the fact that these threads are transnational, that they exist uh, no matter where country you're sitting in, there is an increasing understanding that geography matters. That the world is not so flat as we thought it would be, as Friedman put it uh, a few years ago. That globalization has caused fractures. That uh, inequality within societies and between nations is not overcome at all and sometimes is even growing in certain uh, realities and even Western uh, realities. So as a consequence, politics, uh, as, a, as a natural expression of these inequalities is becoming more contested, is becoming more fragmented. And you all know in the countries where you live or where you come from probably how political systems have become fragmented in the last few years when compared to a few decades um, ago. So geography matters, I said. But also the EU has rediscovered the importance of borders. It rediscovered the importance of its southern border in 2011 as a consequence of the Arab Spring and the, um, and the instability uh, emanating from Syria and Libya. It rediscovered its borders now towards the east with the invasion of Crimea. Uh, by Russia in 2014. In 2015, it was all about protecting its borders from the outside threats as a consequence of the so-called refugee crisis, and also with external powers such as Turkey using those borders uh, for leverage and for um, national concerns. We are witnessing today how Morocco or how Belarus are weaponizing migration and using migration as a tool uh, for, um, uh, for uh, gaining uh, leverage towards the EU. And of course, and uh, speaking uh, now early September after August, we discovered with the return of the Taliban in Afghanistan, how Afghanistan again might become a safe haven for terrorism, a source of refugee flows, or in other words, how the Afghan borders will again matter for what happens for us in Europe. So in other words, for Europe, insecurity often has a geographic dimension and we are rediscovering territory when precisely our idea as Europeans, as a political project for Europeans was to dismantle borders, to try to uh, act globally and to overcome the remnants of sovereignty and borders that had been uh, the source of conflict in the European territory for a long, long time. This means that other actors, and not just Europe is rediscovering ter territory, but other actors are also acting territorially. Makes sense. China with its Belt and Road uh, Initiative, Russia by showing that the West, or by trying to show that the West is in decay and interfering through hybrid threats, hybrid warfare. The US even adopting a foreign policy strategy based on national internal interests and not so much about policing the world and providing uh, public goods. So all these other world actors are also rediscovering the importance of uh, territory. So you add power, changing power dynamics, and you add the fact that territory still matters and it's a defining feature of international politics and you have two elements for this Europe's geopolitical awakening. The third one is the narrative, as I was saying uh, at, the, at the beginning. Um, a narrative basically is a way to project yourself to the outside world. So the European Union, when it adopts a foreign policy narrative, it is basically saying to the rest of the world, what should you see in me that uh, uh, defines me as a, as a global actor? And basically, it is about defining the global environment that you live in, the threats, that emanate from this global environment and that pose a challenge for you as an actor, the interests that you have to defend um, uh, your position in the world, and the tools or the instruments that are at your disposal to pursue uh, such interests. And here, on narrative, the European Union has suffered a very big change in the way it perceives and interacts with the world. 
from the European security strategy in 2003, whereby we were meant to be a normative power to set the normal behavior in international affairs, to base uh, politics on cooperation, on supranational dynamics, on international institutions, even to build postmodern Europe, huh, as Robert Cooper put it many years ago by saying sovereignty is gone, sovereignty is to be superseded by this transnational way of sharing sovereignty. As I said, by acting uh, uh, internally um, in a way that uh, traditional features of international politics were not the main characteristic of the European Union. But that was in 2003. In 2016, so after the crisis, the EU published its global strategy, whereby the terms have changed completely. Now, the, the Europe's strategy is a much more realist strategy, much more realist in, in terms of international politics based on realism, and is aimed basically to defend Europe's interests, to protect the citizens of the European Union, to act as a, as a way to overcome the multiple crises that have affected European integration, to build resilience against this uh, internal and external crisis, also to build strategic autonomy, as I said before, complementary to the US. So, in, a, in other words, to put forward the idea that the EU also has its interests to defend and should be acting as an actor um, defending such uh, interests. But the paradox here is that the European Union, both in 2003 and today, is very good at identifying the changing trends of international politics, the global dimension of where the European Union is heading, even is very good at identifying the threats that emanate from this more troubled world, but is quite bad at putting forward a coherent set of interests for the whole of the European Union, and also quite bad at putting forward the instruments, the capabilities, the tools to actually pursue um, these instruments. And this is what has uh, been shown in the many crises that have affected the European Union internally and externally. The incapacity of the European Union not so much to understand the world it lives in and not so much to understand how others perceive this world and interact with this world, but rather to actually make a step forward for being an effective um, global actor. And the Taliban um, uh, search and the withdrawal of the US recently in Afghanistan again shows us that the European Union is in a quite a poor uh, position to actually defend what it has been its main reason for intervening or for supporting the intervention in Afghanistan. We all knew that without the US, we would not be able to stay in Afghanistan, of course, as Europeans by ourselves. We didn't have the capacities. We didn't even have the mission to do so without the United States. But in any case, the framework on which ideologically the Afghan intervention was based very much had a European flavor. It was about building uh, a nation. It was about reforming its security forces. It was about providing for a good governance framework. It, it was about human rights and uh, the rights of women and, 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 and girls in particular. And all this, of course, we cannot say that the European Union is guilty for what has been done after the US or what is happening after the US withdrawal, but at least, at least we should be able to understand that the framework on which we were operating in Afghanistan very much had also a European flavor or the way we understand international politics. Finally, and Van Middelaar doesn't put enough emphasis on this, but I think it's a crucial um, uh, aspect for understanding whether or not the EU can be a global actor is the institutional and the policy making framework of the European Union. The European Union, as I said before, lacks a joint strategic culture. It rather has multiple strategic cultures, as at least as many as member states are there in the European Union. And these national strategic cultures basically are defined by different history, by different interests, by different um, uh, cultures by different ways of understanding in our member states uh, what the European Union should do. So that explains why many member states are still very reluctant to 
uh, give away foreign policy prerogatives because precisely these national strategic cultures still are a big part of the European Union strategic uh, culture. If you add to this lack of strategic culture the fact that most decisions are taken by unanimity at uh, the Council of the European Union and the European Council, that even agreed positions are even more so vetoed by uh, member states, then the cocktail becomes quite problematic for being an operational actor or an effective actor. Let's remember that Hungary blocked positions on the Middle East peace process that were written for a long time, for many years, in council conclusions. Or also uh, that Hungary blocked uh, council conclusions accusing Beijing on uh, cracking down on democracy in Hong Kong, or even that Cyprus refused to back, to back sanctions on Belarus unless the European Union imposed sanctions on Turkey too. So all these countries, and I'm just saying a few examples here, all have the capacity to block decisions as a consequence of the unanimity rule and veto power that they exercise on Europe's foreign policy. So the big question is on institutions and policy making whether Instead of thinking about uh, geopolitical EU, we should rather think about um, a political union that takes shape before and then a geopolitical uh, union. So by a political union, I mean uh, a joint and a shared strategic culture that actually uh, is at the source of the geopolitical role that the EU is meant to play. So to sum it up, basically, and to try to answer the question that I posed at the beginning on whether Europe can be or not a geopolitical power, there is one certain assessment and it is that the need for a geopolitical Europe, the need for a powerful Europe is there and won't disappear anytime soon. Any event that I just mentioned during these minutes uh, refers to this need for a more geopolitical EU. But if it, it, is, aimed, if it is aimed at doing so, it certainly needs to rethink the way it understands power at the international level, the way it exercises foreign policy at the international level, and most importantly, to refurbish the way it operates and the way its policy-making dynamics and its institution work if it wants to be an effective uh, global actor. In a certain sense, there is a need, and with this I will end, for some sort of convening power at the international level. I was saying at the beginning that most international powers are looking inwards or at least trying to defend its own national interest when acting at the global level. But this doesn't mean that these transnational um, threats, that these transnational dynamics will disappear, no matter how, how internally looking these, um, these powers act. So in a sense, I was saying there is a need for a, convener, for a convener of global powers, for someone who can actually build the bridges and build the alliances and act as a nodal power that can reform and that can make global governance more effective. And that is certainly something that the European Union can uh, contribute to. So when I uh, started thinking about what I have just uh, said to you, I actually realized that basically what I was talking about is something that you will most likely encounter in your, in your careers in the, uh, in the near future. And it is the need to actually mix or to bring together knowledge, understanding, research, or even teaching with practice, with policy making, with the way the world operates and the way institutions or actors operate at the global scene. So I think that today more than ever, there is a need for these um, uh, professionals that are able to build bridges between thinking and between acting. And this is certainly something that I have tried myself to do in my career that I would Assume that most of you are asking yourselves where to go now, what to do next after this great year, despite the circumstances at eBay. So when you ask yourselves, where do I go? What do I want to do? My first recommendation is something that I've always told my students, my, my, that I've always told the, the students myself. It is, first of all, identify what is your 
inner attraction, what something that moves you to do certain things. And it will be very different if you are a person that wants to explain the things that are happening. Then you will be heading towards journalism, for, in, for instance. You will be trying to look at the world and make it public for the rest. You can do that in research as well and in academia, but in any case, you will basically understand whether your basic aim is to explain to others what uh, um, is happening in the world out there. Or you might be an action person. You might be oriented to, um, to, to shaping uh, political dynamics. Well, then you will probably be heading towards being a public official, to, uh, towards passing a concours, either for your national service or for foreign service or for the European Union. Or you might want to actually understand the things, and then you will be heading towards a more research-oriented career. You will be pursuing your PhD. You will be... Um, trying to, um, um, to, to perform these research tasks. But my recommendation is identify that, because it's very hard to go against the tide within yourself. If you are someone that loves action and you pursue research, you will always be missing action. So let's try to first think for yourselves what is that motivates you, because this is exactly what will enable you to pass the hurdles that exist in any of, uh, of these careers. However, and while I'm putting forward three ways of understanding the way to, to act in, in, in global politics, I think, and I started by saying this, that combining thinking and action is actually what uh, is most needed today. So if you are a thinker, or if you decide to be a thinker, mingle with doers. Try to uh, understand how politics are made. Try to understand the logics the institutional logics of power. Try to understand why a bureaucrat acts, acts in a certain way and not in another way. Because if you try to be an actor, even if you do not succeed in being an actor or if you do not want to stay as an actor, you will basically have made a much better contribution to what thinking is, to what research is. Because if you try to be an actor for a while, with a, an internship even, or, or with a short stay at the, at, at the action level, you will be much better thinker than you, than you would imagine. But if also, if you try to be a doer, try to cultivate your thinking. Hmm? Try to still understand that there is a need for a uh, better understanding of the world out there that enables your action to be more informed and to be more in touch with actually what uh, realities and world realities are, um, are describing or are, are, are unfolding. Databases are okay, no? and I'm not arguing against um, quantitative or qualitative methods of uh, research, but in international affairs, as in all social sciences, direct observation is necessary gain some field experience, try to go to that country that you are writing about and that you are interested in, because when you are there, you will see that that thing that you thought was crucial to understand the, and the developments in that country is secondary when compared to that thing that you had never thought about. So in international affairs, in uh, research, in action, some field research, whenever possible, uh, COVID permitting, of course, is necessary. And I will end here with something personal um, remarks that, uh, that, uh, that happened to me a while ago while I was working, as Jacin said at the beginning, at uh, the Political and Security Committee of uh, the European Union, surrounded by diplomats and me being the only non-diplomat in that environment. One um, diplomat, uh, which whom I had a very uh, good relation and that is now a high-ranking position at the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, while we were in that elevator, going down from a meeting uh, uh, in which we had gathered, basically, on my initiative, a whole series of think tankers, academics, uh, NGO professionals, to discuss with the Political and Security Committee ambassador the state of affairs, and so that the Political and Security ambassador at that point um, could give these think tankers, these uh, NGO practitioners, some insights to make them their work better, but also that the ambassador himself could profit from these 
um, from this uh, uh, knowledge that think tanks were producing at that point in time. And I thought that that was a good initiative. The Swedes had done it for a long time and the Spaniards hadn't done it. So I thought, why not getting together with these think tankers and NGO professionals to discuss with the ambassador every now and then, once a month, the, the state of, of, of EU affairs, the state of world affairs. Well, I was getting down the, that elevator with this diplomat that I was mentioning before, and she said to me, all these people that came to this meeting, all these think tankers, researchers, are those people that wanted to be a diplomat, but then didn't succeed. And since they didn't succeed in diplomacy, basically they went into studying diplomacy because they will never be the way us diplomats are. Well, my best advice to you is prove them wrong and combine both aspects. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Morillas, for this ins very interesting presentation and lecture that uh, makes us to, to think and reflect about the challenges that the uh, European Union is, is facing today and, and also about the future of the uh, European integration, integration as, a, as a project. So let's now continue with uh, uh, speak of uh, Professor Andrea Bianculli uh, to address to the students in the name of the EBA faculty. Thank you. Andrea. Good afternoon. Dear outgoing 2020-2021 class students, dear president, dear director, colleagues, families and friends. It is with great honor that I stand before you today to deliver this speech, but especially to celebrate the achievements of our students, your achievements, during these certainly challenging and difficult times. Today is a day of joy, particularly for you as you are now graduating, but also for your families, friends and loved ones who have supported you all along the way. We are here to bid farewell to you as you are leaving eBay and to tear you onto your next steps, which are coming fast. This has been a long journey, particularly exhausting and not always fun, but certainly fruitful and rewarding. Doing a master is described as an emotional roller coaster or an emotional cocktail. I know these phrases may be a cliche, and they probably sound a bit dramatic. But it seems to me that they do explain all the emotions you have when you're doing a master's and living alone in a foreign country, let alone in the middle of a pandemic. Studying abroad comes with a wide range of emotions, happy, sad, excited, homesick, independent, lonely, adventurous. And it also comes with lots of questions like, Will you figure everything out? Will you make any friends? What about your friends and family at home? These questions are completely normal. But this year, you also had to face new questions and concerns created by the current pandemic. However, you were all brave enough to take on and to commit yourselves to a new project. This says a lot about you. You and us, have collectively had our share of struggles. Yet, I'd like to take this moment to shine the light on some of the things you have achieved and you have learned. Over the past 12 months, you had to deal with new educational forms and formats, which were also new to us, that is, teachers, administrative, and IT staff. There was a lot of teaching online, maybe more than we, we would have all liked and expected. When online, we invited you into our homes via our computer cameras, and you invited us into yours, sometimes. This created strange and funny situations, as when we would have uninvited guest appearances, like roommates, family members, and pets, mostly cats, I'd say at least in my case, this has happened several times. 
However, we still had the chance to have hybrid sessions and go back to the classrooms, which we were all longing for. This also came with a lot of specific issues, trying to make out who was behind the mask, keeping the windows and doors open even if it was freezing outside, especially in the evening, and sometimes wondering where the online students were. During these months, you also had to put up with the usual readings, paper assignments, exams, presentations, writing your thesis, doing field work, collecting data, and you also had to deliver these various activities online. This academic course has been difficult for all of us, and particularly for each of you. And yet, you continue to push forward, and you kept going, and that is what matters, and what has brought you all here today. This is all your merit. You managed to show the adaptability and flexibility that the evolving and uncertain circumstances required in the reach for your goal. You also learned about staying connected, supporting each other, and coming to grips with our changing reality. Each of you has persisted in the face of adversity. And this is another important lesson, that perseverance does pay off. While it's certainly true that many things have gone wrong or may have not turned out as we would have liked in the last months, please be proud of your achievements and more importantly, of the resilience and success you have accomplished. This is not the end. It is rather the beginning of a new, perhaps more exciting and unpredictable journey that you will lead you to the next steps. Some of you will return to where you were before. Others will go to different places. In any case, you will all walk through new doors and face new opportunities and challenges. It is difficult to tell what tomorrow may bring to you and us all, or how normality will look like in the near future. I do believe that you will encounter challenges and uncertainty. Life is inherently uncertain. This should not be an obstacle, but rather an opportunity to be creative and innovative and to continue learning. Also, and the pandemic has made it very clear, cooperation, teamwork, solidarity, and empathy are crucial to overcome all difficulties. Always bear in mind that everybody you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. Be kind, always. But don't forget to be kind to yourselves, too. My hope is that in the end, among the messages that stand the test of time are that dedication, hard work, and solidarity pay off. I strongly believe, going by your antecedents and the manner you have conducted yourselves over these months, that you will surely overcome all obstacles and make the most of the opportunities. The adaptability, flexibility, and commitment that you have shown and that you will soon bring to the world are vital. Rarely before has the world so desperately required the skills that are essential in the disciplines represented by this class, that is, by you. They certainly come at a most appropriate time. Whatever course your future takes, we all hope that you will look back on our, your time at eBay as having provided the right tools for you to meet and deal with the tests and opportunities that life presents and make your objectives become a reality. On behalf of eBay, I would like to thank you all for making us part of your education and professional journey. We are truly grateful for that opportunity. I hope and ask you to stay in touch with us, as we will miss you. Congratulations on your graduation, students of the Masters in International Relations and the Mundus MAP Programme 2020-2021. You did it. Most well deserved. Let me just conclude by saying, hasta pronto, fin sabiat, 
and by wishing you every success in this new chapter of your life. Celebrate this moment and look forward to what is yet to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea, for your nice speaking words. Uh, let's now continue with the uh, uh, speech of uh, Luisa Kramer, student uh, of the Masters in International Relations here at UDA. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm a little nervous to be standing here today. This is an unusual situation for me and for you. So many of us in the same room, offline, in person. If I have a blackout now, I can't even pretend my laptop died or I accidentally muted myself. Um, and most of you had to comb your hair and wear real pants or even dresses and heels. Good job. Well, at this point, hello to everyone joining us online. I hope you enjoy your cup of coffee or a glass of wine, wearing your comfy clothes. Rest assured, I will not start this with a stressful icebreaker. You can go on, cook your lunch, shower, write your thesis on the side, whatever feels natural to you during online events. However, I'm not only nervous to be standing here, but also very proud. Proud to be celebrating this moment with every one of you, our families, our professors, and eBay staff. If we forget about the final research project for a second, we did it, yay. <laughs> if anything, we can be sure that this cohort really wanted to study at eBay. Most of us applied for this master's program knowing there was an ongoing pandemic. Many of us moved here from cities in Catalonia, Spain, or abroad, knowing that they would have to fight through visa processes, travel restrictions, and high uncertainties. We do not know, or we did not know, what life in Barcelona would look like. We did not know we would learn the very useful skill of walking home past curfew like a ninja, always in the shadows. At least that's what it feels like after a glass of wine. We also did not know when we would be able to meet any of our classmates and professors in person. We did not know that the IR theory exam would be the first time some of those names on the screen would finally be connected to a face. We did not know that dinners with a maximum of six persons would help us to form deeper connections. We did not know a lot about this masters. We were adventurous. Well, and we were also very well supported. It is not by our own accomplishment alone that we can be here today. We can be so grateful to all the professors, staff members of the admissions office, the academic office, the eBay leadership, and all the other persons behind the scenes. We and COVID-19 have caused a lot of extra work. Yes, we were expecting uncertainty, but it did not stop us from asking a lot of questions. And while COVID was a challenge to everyone, I always felt well informed by the university. You could feel how much time was invested uh, in fighting for any little way of lifting the restrictions and working with different scenarios, all to make our experience as valuable as possible. These long emails explaining the first measures to get back to hybrid teaching, the opportunity to follow online lectures on campus, together, to use the library to be more flexible regarding deadlines and course changes, to provide high quality online teaching. I think we could take this moment and thank eBay for the hard work with a round of applause. <laughs> and now I'm nervous again because I have a confession to make. Even though I'm graduating in international relations today, I have only Googled the difference between relations and relationships a few days ago. 
I mean, I can now proudly spell sovereignty and Przewozki, as that spell, not pronounce. Um, but I wasn't entirely sure what I had even studied. And to be honest to my Mundus map friends, it took me a few lectures to find out what policy really means. And maybe I'm the only person here struggling with seemingly easy terms, but I will try to explain the terms relation and relationships anyways. According to the very trustworthy source, difference between .NET, a relation identifies similarities between people. For example, we are in the same Blackboard Collaborate session. Your name, like my name, is fully spelled out with all the ugly middle names you would rather like to be forgotten. If we have a relationship, however, there is a connection between us, like the bonding moment of meeting in a breakout room, finding out that we're all secretly wrapped in blankets under our desks, forming friendships over our duvet cover designs before passionately debating with the devil's advocate in the reading group sessions. So I guess my message for today is don't just relate to others, but form relationships. Because this is what we have been missing. This is what COVID had almost pre prevented us from having. The lecture content was still there to be consumed, hundreds of readings to be studied, but the heated discussions, the desperate study groups, the long coffee breaks, and smaller or bigger workload crisis, we almost missed that, relationships. Sitting alone in your room, watching the online lecture, you will imagine everyone sitting there, happily nodding to the lecture content, understanding each and every single word, ready to give a qualified comment at any time. You don't see their confused faces and their hectic note-taking. The others feel just like you. Here, WhatsApp groups like the sinking ship were the most useful tool we had in our studies. A safe space where we can admit not to have understood a single word of the two-hour online lecture that had just finished. Where we can celebrate the moment of handing in essays one minute before midnight via Skype where we can admit being overwhelmed and not always functioning like you think you should. Looking after each other's mental health is something we all had to learn in COVID times and is something we should all maintain. Asking each other, what's the crack? How are you? No, really, what is the crack? And then, even harder, answering the question truthfully. These relationships are what kept us going. They are the secret to our success. Well, that and the constant assurance of our dear economics professor, Joseph, which became a mantra of our joint WhatsApp group. Don't worry. So don't worry. Don't worry about your future. COVID has certainly changed everyone's plans. We are flexible now. The curfew has given some of us a few months of long good night sleeps and we are fully rested to start into a bright future. Well, maybe you were more the type to organize meetings lasting the exact duration of the curfew, the famous 10 to 6 parties. Perfect, you have stamina, you are innovative, creative, flexible regarding rules and regulations. You will be very successful in politics. Okay, maybe we should worry sometimes. It is part of the job description of a politics student to worry. Please, guys, worry. Worry about climate change. Worry about US elections, about xenophobia and homophobia. Worry about outbreaks of violent conflict and humanitarian crisis. Worry about the distribution of vaccines. Worry about the distribution of power. Unfortunately, this master's has taught me new ways to worry, new ways to think about politics. Unfortunately, with this knowledge comes responsibility. And 
I say unfortunately because there's a lot to do and no one can do it alone. But we can also not do it together if we are just relating to others. We need true relationships in world politics just as much as in our, our private sphere. So let's make sure to start here, today. Have meaningful relationships. Be a strong network of friends, supporting each other professionally and personally, with LinkedIn contacts or funny memes, job offers, research input, or a couch to sleep on in a new city. We started our friendship online. It should be easy to maintain it online and across borders. Come on, let's build international relationships. Thank you. Now uh, start with the uh, confirmament uh, of degrees. Now I ask the, the president. Uh, he's here in the. And now we are going. We are going to call you uh, with names. Uh, so uh, Robert Kizer is going to have the list. Right, everyone. Um, this is our second time today doing a graduation, so we want to be a little bit quicker, a little bit smarter, and definitely a lot more prepared. So this is how it's going to work. We have you all in a seating arrangement that is very important because the way in which you, the pattern you come up will uh, ensure that you get the right paper, that your name is read out at the right time, and so on. So what we would like to do is this. If you could please, in everyone in the first row, so this will be here, I can see, um, I see Martin there. Martin's row, if you could all get up in your order. If you stand at the bottom of the stairs, I will call the name, and then in, uh, two people will come up. So I call one name, you pick up a, a diploma. Please, no handshakes. Everything has to be just touched into the paper. I call a second name, and then you proceed to here, this wonderful lady here will take a photograph and there will be the video and then we will move on around that way. So I think we can do this really smoothly. I will interrupt from time to time when we move to our online participants who are watching us from this roving camera and their name will appear up here. So I think we're all ready to go. So let's get the show on the road. So it gives me great pleasure to talk, uh, to introduce first of all today the students of the Masters of International Relations and we're gonna begin with uh, Liana Anderson, Step up, please. If you want to come here. Martin Bernal. Just, just wait for come forward here, Martin, please. I love your bow tie. Nice sash as well. <laughs> want to be in your sash so you get in the photo? There we go. There we go. So, pass this way, please. And now we're going to keep on going. Makala Biddle, please come forward. <laughs> Louisa Kramer. Bethany Dunn, and Julia Esteve. Right, next we have... Caliceravitas? Yes, you came on late, late camera. Okay, if you would like to come up, please, we have your diploma. Can't see you from there. And Augustine Garcia. Late camera, too, so. No, just the question.
Next row, we're going to begin with Elisaveta. Elisaveta uh, Garishnova. Come forward, please. <laughs> Next of all, we have Yanatsia Grencheneva. And if the people in that row, if you want to come up and move forward so you can be next in the line. So everyone come forward. It's funny how we do it the second time. It doesn't run any better than the first time. So you in the rows behind, this is the pattern. Wonderful. Okay, next on my list I have Enrique Herrero, and that's Enrique there. Patrick Hart. Bastian Corp. I can see you there. And Carsten Kumps, please. Eunice Mahmoudi, please. And Valentin Morai. Maria Nicolau. And we need, the next row has not come forward, Alison Pruschen. Go. Alison, good. Yorick, too. All of you move along to get ready to be in the line. Fantastic. Alison, please. Yorick Shalma. And Peter Senenko. Fantastic. Everyone's so much taller than I thought on the screen. Yeah, good. I didn't think anyone was taller than Yorick. Celia Torstenston and Rosa Gabriel, Gabriela um, Ochoa. Jan Ulkis. And from the part time program, Carolina Baria. Right, so the last two students are also with the IR program part-time, so the 2019-21. The first is Jack Poole. <laughs> and secondly, Mathieu Wallet. Right. 
There we go. Photo time. Although the Mundus map students are clearly really ready for it, we're just going to pause very slightly. We're going to go to the screen because there are at least two, five students who are not here, but they're participating online. So the first of those, we have Tanya Kramer. Tanya. Uh, uh, Kayana Moayedi. Marco Osando. Uh, Moira Pase Kutra. And lastly, Emma Petit from the part time program. Well done, Emma. So, moving on to the graduates of the two-year program, the Erasmus Mundus of Public Policy. First up, we have, um, please come forward, Bianca Damati. <laughs> and Bisharu Hussein. Michelle Magvasi. Michelle Magvasi, is she here? No. Okay. Uh, um, Saida Mamadunova. Yes. Pablo Mindadakis. Someone's brought their own canned applause by the sound of it. Or else we have a water leakage in the back. Uh, Hannah Taylor. Hannah Taylor. Grace Van der Pui. And finally, it gives me great pleasure to bring up Shahanda El Nagar. Is she here? <laughs> we have Sana Navik Navik. Nakvia. Nakvia. Sana, I'm so sorry. <laughs> right. Well, second time was definitely no smoother than the first time. We'll try harder at six o'clock, maybe then with development and security, we'll really have this machine well oiled and functioning well. Thank you very, very much. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to congratulate everyone who has completed the masters, either in one year or in two years. Um, as both of the people who spoke first, um, Andrea Biancoli and also from Lama, Lara Crema, uh, thank you. Very, very powerful sentiments in so far as the idea that we got through this together, but I think more especially you got through it. Uh, it's your, your success. Uh, it's been very, very impressive. I've um, seen firsthand a lot of the difficulties people have had when they've applied for special dis dispensations and all kinds of things, and I can't believe how much people have had to persevere, and I think I, I only echo the words that others have said, which is it's truly inspiring, and you really, really deserve a huge amount of credit for every piece of effort, every last minute of patience and uh, of solidarity and, and of empathy that you've shown this year, or two years for those in Wonders Map this year here. Uh, and I really would like to give you a, a, a you know, heartfelt round of applause. You deserve great success, and I'm very happy for each and every one of you. So well done, everyone. <laughs> Thank you.
And now, now to, uh, to conclude uh, the graduation ceremony, the president of eBay, uh, Narcis Serra, is going to address uh, final words uh, for you, for our well, students. We need to close the graduation ceremony. And I think that it's a good, uh, bad idea, a mistake, if I uh, prepare another speech to close the ceremony. So let me make only two points. One, is to explain to you that our aim as eBay uh, is not only increase your knowledge, your academic knowledge in international relations, but enlarging your vision of the problems of the world, helping you to have your own approach to addressing the problems of our world. Uh, In my speciality, I have to read very often one uh, author of an important book of strategy, Clausewitz. Clausewitz, 200 years ago, made a revolution in the military academies. He was the director of the Kriegs Academy in Berlin uh, and wrote Strategy is meant to educate the mind of the future commander, or more accurately, to guide him in his self-education. So, I hope that your studies in the course uh, 2021 have been fruitful in the process of your own plans, your personal plans for your personal formation or education. And to do so, uh, don't limit your efforts to the academic field. Take into account, please, that to improve your expertise in international relations, you need to increase your linguistic skills. Take into account as well that you have to have historical sensitivity, to have an instinctive curiosity for the culture of the others, for the culture of other peoples, their values, their principles, because our mission is to spread the diagnosis on the international problems to build up bridges paths of dialogue because uh, in the recent years nobody can deny that we are in immersed in a uh, process of very, very uh, quick uh, globalization. It's undeniable that. But is under discussion, one, the equilibrium or not, the balance between costs and benefits of the process of uh, globalization, and above all, the consequences in the societies. The consequences of globalization are very unevenly uh, distributed. And inequality, not in the sense of the complete world because uh, China is destroying all the statistics of uh, inequality in the uh, undeve underdeveloped world. But uh, uh, inequality remains one of the elements more or, or the most dangerous for the peace processes in the world. Uh, we are an institute open 
to all the theories of economic and international relations. But uh, we are fighting and be back to the Stoics, you know the, the answer, from which police you come from. And the Stoic philosopher uh, answer, uh, I am cosmopolitan. Uh, my police, my police is the world. Mm. So, as in many other things, we can go to Greece to find there the seal, the, 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 the principal, the beginning of our thought uh, today. Uh, let's be clear. Uh, we are in this world a community, whether or not the realism accepts this assessment. Asser uh, assertion uh, and uh, a professor that died, uh, died uh, was dying uh, three or four years ago Ulrich Bech uh, wrote that uh, at least we are a community of risk the pandemia the natural disasters, the floods in Germany, in the United States, are demonstrating that the risks of the world are common. And the solution uh, will have to be common. Mm? That's the reason why I consider that we can make an important task a spreading in our societies this sort of uh, assessment. And to finish, let me congratulate all of you for your achievements. We are very grateful for your patience in the difficult conditions of the course and the uh, uh, flexibility to adapt to uh, online teaching uh, has been an, a, a, a hard effort for you and for the faculty as well. Mm -hmm. So, congratulations, and uh, in the name of the UA, I wish you a very, very clear luck in your future career. Thank you very much.